And just by way of background, I, I am a, a medical doctor. I trained as a general surgeon in New Zealand, and then I came to the UK about 25 years ago. And since 1992, I've been working with an organization called the Christian Medical Fellowship, which is a, a group of, of Christian doctors, about 4,000 of us, and about 1,000 medical students. And we exist really to unite and equip Christian doctors to, to live and to speak for Jesus Christ in this generation. So that, that's really my, my burden. I had no intention or interest in getting involved with media stuff at all. And uh, you know, so some, some people say that these things you're born into. Uh, for others, uh, you achieve them. And for others, it's thrust upon you. And for me, it was very much the, the, the last because I wanted to avoid it uh, at, all, at all costs. And uh, unfortunately, the, the work I took on thrust me into the situation where simply media opportunities came and I had to make a decision whether I was going to, to take them or not. And uh, really, most of my experiences in doing interviews on, on news programs and, and comment programs, largely on issues at the interface of Christianity and medicine, because that's w where we tend to be in demand to give a Christian voice into the national debate. And I started getting involved about 15 years ago. Uh, I don't know how many interviews I've done. I suspect it's somewhere between about 100 and 150 every year since then. And that there are times when it's incredibly busy and you might do 20 in a day. And there are others where you'll go for two, three, four weeks maybe without anything at all. And that's just the nature of the, the media. It's episodic and you've got to be always available for it. So I think first of all, <clears throat> it was a, a reluctant thing where I, I was trying to avoid it. And to be honest, I was quite scared and frightened about being involved in it uh, as, as well. And the person who got me involved was actually a, a Catholic uh, sister who I got to know who'd done a lot of media and she said she had the ministry of pushing people off the high diving board who were reluctant to get involved and she, she saw that I was a person who needed some encouragement to, to jump. And so uh, she got me involved in that way. And I was advised right at the beginning by a friend who'd done a lot of media that he said, start, he said, start with friendly recorded radio. Friendly, Christian journalists, recorded, so if you make mistakes, you can do it again. Uh, radio, so they can't see you. <laughs> and so this was my plan, to, to go in with friendly recorded radio. And unfortunately, the very first thing I ever did on media was hostile live television debate. <laughs> and it was because this uh, dear sister uh, rang me up and said, Peter, you've got to do it. There's no one else available. And I went off really with my knees knocking and, and did a, a live debate on television about uh, a medical issue called pre-implantation diagnosis. And I was literally shaking all the way through it, although people said watching it afterwards, I, I did reasonably OK. And they didn't see that I looked so fearful as I really felt. So I think that that is the thing, is that we do have to overcome our fears to do these things. Very early on, the very first time I ever did uh, sound bites for a, a national news package, it was on an issue of uh, contraception, and I decided what I was going to say beforehand. I had my sound bites all organized and memorized, and I knew that they were taking these recordings and would splice them into the news package. And uh, I was in the taxi on the way, and I was just trying to remember and rehearse again what I was going to say. And I, I was so nervous, I just could not remember it or bring it to mind. And so I thought, well, I've just got to check my notes again. And I went to open my bag, and uh, it was a combination lock with just six digits in it. And I was so stressed and nervous, I could not remember what the combination lock was on, on my bag. And so uh, in the end, I had to force the lock and, and break the lock to open this to, to read my notes. And the interview went OK. But I think the lesson is that all of us find these things when we start out, they're difficult and they are stressful. But it's an issue of uh, being prepared to face our fears. I think another thing that I, I thought was that a, a good reason to not go into media is because of the dangers of pride. You know, you're on a pedestal, everyone sees you there, how wonderful it is. 
and, uh, and, and I remember saying this to someone at a media training day who was training us, and he said, he said, yes, I hear a lot of Christian leaders give that excuse for not getting involved. But he said, I think the real pride is people who are unprepared to put their heads above the parapet and go into the public square for fear that they might be humiliated. And they're so concerned about their public image that they're not prepared to take the step of faith and, uh, and step up and do it. And I was very challenged by that because it spoke right to my heart that here I was justifying my non-involvement uh, on the basis of I didn't want to uh, pander to my pride when in actual fact it was my pride that was stopping me uh, being involved. Now that's not to say that pride is not a problem when you do this stuff, but uh, we really need to look very carefully at our motives. So what I'm going to do is pretty much follow the handout that you've got. I hope so. It will be reasonably straightforward for you. And uh, looking first of all at the current media scene. And I think the first thing we see in, in Europe over the last few decades is the rise of militant secularism. Now what I mean by that is that the media tends to be populated disproportionately by people who have an atheist worldview. God doesn't exist, death is the end, man's a clever monkey. And they have secular humanist ethics. So they have very predictable views on things like sexuality, abortion, family, the place of Israel, you know, everything politically correct. You can pretty much predict. And that's because we live in a society which is increasingly dominated by secular culture and where the mountains of culture, parliament, education, uh, the institutions, uh, the arts, and of course the media, all the th things that shape culture are increasingly uh, dominated by people with these views. So we've got the rise of militant secularism as well, which is why it's all more important that we're out there. The second thing, that what we call the global village, this degree of connectedness so that what happens in one small area of the world uh, ultimately, uh, very quickly, will proliferate everywhere else. And also the huge proliferation of newspapers, news channels, internet, uh, radio stations, television, everybody's in it. So there are, there are hundreds and thousands of these possible outlets in a way that there weren't before. How the media works, that what I've called the shark fest. What this means is that uh, 20 or 30 years ago, the way the media worked is that reporters would go out, they'd be sent out, they'd go out to some event and they'd take notes and then they'd come back and write it all up. Well, of course, no one does that now. They all sit in front of their television, uh, their uh, computer screens. And if you go into any big media office, go into the BBC, there's just hundreds of people there sitting in front of computer screens. And it's all coming to them streamed through social media. And there are newspapers all around and they're reading them. And what they're seeing is, what's everybody else talking about? We're going to talk about that as well. So it's like the, the modern day Athens where everybody is talking about the very uh, latest thing. And a shark fest means that some issue or story comes into prominence and everybody chases the story and everybody copies everybody else. So things move very quickly. Social networking has really changed things. Now, when I first got into media uh, 15 years ago, the words Twitter and Facebook and blog uh, did not exist. I can remember the first time I heard each of those words, but they have utterly transferred, uh, transformed our world. And what it's meant is that it's given every single individual the opportunity to be involved in international media in a way that was never possible before. So it's the democratization of uh, news in a sense. Everybody can be their own news reporter and everybody can engage with everybody else uh, on social media. And I think Facebook is much more about proliferating stories. You get a story that goes viral on Facebook, you, know, you, you can get tens of thousands of people reading it within a very short period of time through those networks. Whereas Twitter is partly about proliferation, but it's also about interaction. It's being having, having access to uh, 
opinion formers and, and newsmakers around the world and being able to interact with them uh, directly. And just an example of, of uh, how this works, I remember in, in Britain just a few years ago, there was uh, a politician, one of the, the leaders of the cabinet in, in our current Tory government, who had previously voted against uh, homosexual uh, liberty, gay marriage and, and so on. And when she was appointed to the position of Home Secretary, the gay lobby went for her. And there was one particular uh, very popular media commentator who had over a million followers on Twitter. And he put out a message which was basically sack the homophobic Home Secretary. They set up a, a Facebook group. Within four days, 70,000 people had uh, liked it. And then on the, on the Friday afternoon, news program on television, she was confronted with this in front of the whole nation. And she changed her position just like that in an instant of time. And since then has become a very powerful gay rights advocate. Why did it happen? Well, it was all about the power of social networking. And the other thing, of course, is, is uh, online newspapers. Now, uh, in, the, in the old days, a news story would be printed. You wrap your food up in it one day and then it's gone and lost and you have to go to, to uh, media archives in order to, to find it. But now, of course, everything is put up on the web. It lasts forever. You can reaccess it. You can search for it. And journalists use old stories to write their new ones. You'll see that so often a new story is just a cut and paste of something that's been done before. But the other thing it's enabled is, is online interaction. So previously, if you write a letter to your newspaper, you have to wait several days. It might not be selected, and then it may appear in print. But now you can go immediately and rapidly respond to a news story. And now, if, if there's a very high-profile story, within a day or two, you might have a 1,000 responses that people have started. And then they'll have discussions online. So lots more people are able to be involved. And that's the world in which we live in, and we need to adapt much more to that world. So why, why get involved in media? Well, obviously, first of all, it's a much, much wider audience than you will find in any other context. Uh, just an example of this. I, I can get up in the morning and go to a, a news studio at 7 o'clock on a Sunday. And we have a, a system in Britain called the BBC Newsround where you go and sit in a news studio for two hours. And every 10 minutes, another regional BBC radio station rings you up and you do a six to eight minute interview or debate on a particular issue. And you, you do the same issue for every single thing. So you're going all around the country doing this. And of course, you get better as the morning goes on. <laughs> Now, on a morning like that, you can, you can get up at 7 o'clock, sit for two hours in a studio, do 10 interviews with 100,000 people listening to everyone, roll up at church at 9.30, and you may hear a great sermon, but delivered to 200 people, you see. And of course, the people that are hearing you on media are people who would never darken the doors of a church. So it's an incredibly wide audience that we have. And then secondly, there is the opportunity for dialogue. Now, I think the media is in many ways the modern day Athens. We know that, that Paul went to Athens and he engaged the people in the marketplace. And the dialogue that he was having, the two-way conversation, attracted a crowd to come around and listen to what was <coughs> being said. And because of the interaction, other people were interested, perhaps even much more interested than they would have been had he just stood up on a ladder and, and spoken. And that's the beauty of radio is that so much, and television, so much of it is dialogue that enables interaction. And uh, in, it, people can come back with their rebuttals and then you have to uh, take, take them on and challenge them. I think another really important reason is that it gives confidence to the church. When, when Christians hear on national or regional radio or television, they, they see a known Christian giving a Christian point of view plausibly in words that, that ordinary people understand. Then they gain confidence themselves that these, these views expressed well have real currency in the public square. 
and it gives them more confidence to, in their own one-to-one -one conversation, but it also gives Christians more confidence to get into the media themselves. They say, well, if, you know, if he can do it or she can do it, well, maybe with God's help, uh, I can do it as well. And I think that's an, a, an important element of Christian leadership is that we have to be willing to take the initiative and be the first person up the mountain to cut the steps so that other people can then follow in our footsteps after us. Now, uh, I just wanted to look at some biblical principles that I think are important in this whole area and which have certainly helped me. Uh, first of all, the whole idea of, of taking thoughts captive. This is the way that Paul described the interaction that he did, that he was out there with Christian truth attempting to rebut the errors that were there. And we know that the devil's power base is wrong ideas or lies or falsehood. And Paul talked about spiritual warfare in the context of taking arguments captive. And the way he took arguments captive was that he took the lies of the world and challenged them and rebutted them and put another point of view so that people were then able to, to hear the truth. And if we look at the, the model that the apostles used through the book of Acts, they tended to do things not uh, in monologue, but in dialogue. Not in the environment where they felt comfortable, but actually in the environment where their listeners felt comfortable. And they also spoke in words that people understood. So they de-jargonized everything that they said. They used the language of the street. And uh, this is what media is all about. It's uh, truth, words people understand in the context of dialogue and in an environment where they feel comfortable because those listening are in their own homes and their own cars and uh, you're able to, to get to them and make them think uh, when you would never otherwise have had any contact with these people at all. Often media, it, it's, you have this impression of being hemmed in and surrounded. I like to think of, of Elisha with his servant holed up in the city with the enemy army outside and, and how worried the servant was when he looked out and saw the enemy there. And then, of course, Elisha prayed that his eyes would be open so that he could see God's army of angels around and, and know that God's army was much uh, greater. And the psalmist talks about the nations surrounding me. And that's very much what it's like. You're in the spotlight, you're being seen, you're being listened to, and you have to have the bigger picture to know that actually God is in control and that um, you, you are being supported by him. Often media stuff is like a, it's like a firestorm where you're stuck in the middle and everybody is having a go at you. And it's a great encouragement, I think, to remember that God's people through the scriptures were often in the middle of firestorms. Think of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Uh, he felt all alone. Of course, there were 7,000 others who had not bowed the knee to Baal. But it didn't alter the fact that when he was on Mount Carmel, it was just him and 400 prophets of Baal, and yet God gave him the words to say. Think of Jesus in Jerusalem with the crowds gathering round and answering him questions or Paul being dragged up before the magistrates to give an account of the faith that he had uh, in him. And the media stuff is very like that. And so it's incredibly important that we, we, we know and believe uh, the truth that God is actually in control, that it's he who's sovereign over all the principalities and powers, that we fight uh, not against flesh and blood, that these very formidable uh, news interviewers or opponents that we're up against are simply people made in God's image who desperately need to know him, just as everybody does. And, and they, they suddenly and gradually start to look much less formidable if you, uh, once you grasp that. But it is God who's sovereign over the nations of the earth. It's he who gives people authority. And it's he who rises nations and pulls them down. So uh, we need to remember that we're serving him. And to be realistic about the fact that this is a, a spiritual battle, not to be naive about it, but as I was saying earlier, to grasp the fact that 
the devil's power base is wrong ideas. He wants people to believe lies, to live according to them, to become enslaved by them, and not to see the truth. So we are in a spiritual battle, and we need both our weapons of uh, attack, you know, the, the word of God, and we need also our weapons of defense to know where we stand with him, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, uh, and so on, that we're going in uh, with him behind us. But we also need to be prepared and willing. Remember uh, when Moses passed on to Joshua as the leader and his words, be strong and courageous because the Lord will be with you wherever you go. But Joshua needed to believe that and rise to that challenge and be willing to take on the leadership. And I think of Esther. Uh, there she was in the king's palace, very comfortable. But when Mordecai came to her and said, look, Esther, you've been put in the position where you can influence the king in a way that nobody else can. And there may be great cost for you. When Esther went to the king, in that case, she didn't know whether even if her life might be in danger. But she recognized that she was put in a special place for a special purpose when Mordecai said to her, maybe you've been brought to royal power at a time such as this. So we need to be willing, willing as Isaiah was when, when he said to God in the temple, here am I, send me. We need to be people who say yes when the opportunity comes along and who don't shrink away from it. And we need to be, uh, to keep our head. We may feel nervous and frightened inside, but the Lord tells us don't be anxious about anything. Uh, keep your head in all circumstances, Paul says to Timothy. As the psalmist tells us, God is our refuge and our strength in time of trouble. So we can be in a situation which uh, may frighten us, but God tells us to remain calm uh, because we can trust in him, because he will actually give us the words to say. And I think for me, one of, one of the difficulties I had was well, what if I'm stuck in a situation, they ask me a question, I don't know how to answer it. What, what do I, I'm just going to look stupid then, or you know, I, I'm, I just don't have the eloquence of this person or that person, you know, why me? And, and it was a great encouragement to me, and still is, to think back about all the people that God has used throughout history and <coughs> biblical times and the excuses they had. Think of Moses saying, I'm not eloquent, why don't you send Aaron, he's He's far better than me. And then God says, well, who made the mouth? Who made the tongue? And I'll be with you. Or think of Isaiah saying, I'm a man of unclean lips. And that God sent him. And as uh, God promised later through him, no weapon forged against you will prevail. But you will refute every tongue that accuses you. As, as uh, the Lord said to Jeremiah, he, he said, I'm only young, I can't do this. And, and God said, well, I will give you the words to say. In the same way that he said to his apostles as well, during the discourse he gave on the Mount of Olives, just before he went to the cross, he said, you'll be brought up between the four kings and princes, but don't be anxious about those situations, because I will give you the words to say. Um, in that situation. And I can honestly say that despite all my fears, my experience has been that I find it very hard to think of any occasion when I haven't had the words in a media interview. And often afterwards I've been quite surprised at what I've come out with. I think, how did I think to say that? And, and I know it's not me. But you know, as you're doing the interview and the question's being asked or you're hearing the opponent in the debate saying something, then already the, 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 the thoughts are starting to formulate as to how you're going to ask, answer that question. And the Lord is far, far more concerned about us speaking for him well than we are, even. And he does promise to give us the words to say. And I think it, it, take, it does take the courage to say, well, yes, I'm going to do this. But then uh, the more you do it, you find God always delivers and your, uh, it then builds your confidence for the next time so that you're more willing to say yes next time. 
And as I, I described earlier on, when I first got involved in doing media things, I was really very frightened. I don't really have those feelings anymore now. I wouldn't say that I relish it. It's often with some reluctance, particularly when it comes at a busy time and I don't feel I can uh, make the space for it. But uh, like anything in life, things that we initially found really difficult, you think when you preach your first sermon, uh, pray your first prayer in public and how you felt about doing it, and then uh, after you've done it a few hundred times or whatever, it ceases to bother you anymore. And I think media is very much like that as well. It's just another skill that you take on and that you get more competent in doing. So some biblical principles to, to look at. Now, in terms of uh, the, the whole media, the, the different areas that we can influence, and I think what I'd say here is that uh, getting involved in media is not just about going and doing interviews yourself or getting other people to do them. It's about shaping the whole process by which the media deals with an interview. And I don't think I realized this when I first got involved, but when a media person is charged with putting together, say, a half-hour documentary on areas of which we might be interested in, on euthanasia, for example. So they're told to go away and produce a documentary on euthanasia, and they have to think about how they're going to shape it and plan it, what their key messages are, who they involve in doing it, and so on. And many of the people who take these things on know absolutely nothing about the subject when they start. And I, maybe a, a few hours after they've done the program, they know nothing either, because they've forgotten it all. So they're, they're approaching this with the skills of putting together a program, but knowing nothing about it. And so where do they get their information from? Well, in this media age, they, they go to the internet, or they talk, more likely they'll talk to individuals who know the subject well, because they tend to be verbal people. And so often you can have an opportunity to shape the way a program is put across in the discussions you have with them as they're researching together to put something, uh, to put something together. So uh, it doesn't worry me at all if I'm talking to a media person and I don't end up being on the program giving a soundbite. If I can have a 20-minute discussion with them and explain what the key issues are and what the messages are, and give them some good spokesmen to put this across, then they'll be very grateful to me because I'm helping them with their program. But they will also, I will have also helped to shape the way this program is put across. And the, the, the thing is, if we as Christians aren't involved in helping to shape it, then it will be shaped by the agendas of the other side on the issue. So we, we have to be in there. And of course, uh, we have these different media. So first of all, there is the press. And uh, there is the national media, the national press, there's regional press, there's the Christian press, there's different sorts. And they, they're all doing different kind of art, articles, uh, news stories, letters, debates, uh, or whatever. And you need to be able to, to understand what they're exactly looking for. And someone who's writing a news story generally just wants a, a sentence or two to put in expressing one point of view. Uh, if you're doing a debate, say for a regional newspaper, they want, may want a 500 word summary of your side that they can put it up, up against someone else. If, if uh, you're wanting to write a letter, then it might be a two or 300 word thing. So you need to understand about exactly what they're looking for and to shape your contribution accordingly. With radio, there are, I, I always ask the question, um, you know, when is this? What program is it? Is it going to be live or recorded? Is it a debate or an interview? In other words, is it just me and the presenter, or am I going to be up against somebody else? And if I'm going to be up against someone else, who is it? Now, often it might not be decided yet, but you know, what kind of person might it be? Because you're going to shape 
your preparation accordingly. It may well be someone you've met before, or you may want to Google them and find out more about them so that you can predict what their arguments are going to be so you're ready to counter them when they, when they come up. <clears throat> yeah, so is it recorded or live? Is it an interview or a debate? Uh, perhaps the other question on radio, is it friendly or hostile? That's incredibly important. Is it a Christian radio station who are wanting to put your view across and doing an interview of 20 minutes which they're going to transcribe and put up on a website and save you the time of writing it? Then you'll approach it in a certain way. But if it is a hostile program who are trying to nail you as a bigoted fundamentalist you know, Christian, then you'll approach the the thing in a different sort of way. So we need to understand the whole context into which we are speaking. Television. And again, there are lots of different formats. So that when is it? Is it live or recorded? Is it a debate or an interview? Who am I up against? And, and so on. Will all affect the way that you, you do it. But then to know exactly what they're looking for, what their end product is. So I'll say to someone who brings up from a news program, I'll say, look, are you looking for recorded sound bites that you're trying to put into a news package before a program? And I'll say, yes. Yeah. So uh, what sort of sound bite are you looking for? I say, well, we really just want about 20 seconds giving your message. So I'm going to prepare in a certain way. I'm going to think, what's the 20 second sound bite that really encapsulates the message I want to put across? And then when I go to film it, I know it's going to be recorded and edited, and that they'll take the sound bite that best puts my message across. So often what I'll do in that situation is they might have a series of questions, but I'll just give the same answer every time to the camera, because I know that they're not all going to be put on one after the other. They'll just take the one. And you also know that you can then force them down a route into which they have to take this particular message because there's no other thing that they can take from it. On the other hand, if it is a live interview, then you prepare uh, in a different uh, kind of way for that. And then uh, with regard to new media, and I think this is what's really changed media over the last five years, uh, years or so, is the the emergence of, of Twitter and Facebook and blogging that you can, uh, there, there are lots of other ways that you can get onto the media. So uh, five years ago, you couldn't launch a new news story by writing a blog, but now you can. If it's something that's new and true and interesting and a journalist picks it up, you may well find that it becomes a regional or a national news story and that you can, you can launch it. So how do we influence journalists? We've found, first of all, and budget does come into this, obviously, but we have found it's been very worthwhile for us to employ a media consultant. And I work for two organizations. My main job is with the Christian Medical Fellowship, but I also act as the campaign director for another group called Care Not Killing. And Care Not Killing campaigns against euthanasia and for good care. Care, not, not killing. And so we use the same media consultant for both of these. Now this is someone who has had uh, lots of experience in media, who knows lots of journalists, who knows people on all the major newspapers, all the major news channels of radio and television, and who has certain people who trust him, and who can pick up the phone and, and get a journalist's undivided attention. And we pay this person a retainer every month to be available to do that. Now, what does that give us? Well, on the one hand, it gives us connections that we would never have had before. So journalists we don't know personally, this person does know, he can ring them up and say, well, I know exactly the person you need to talk to, and he creates the connection then with us to, to come back. But as well as giving us connections, it, it protects 
us. And I, I'm really grateful for the protection the media uh, consultant gives me because I know the first phone call is going to go to him and not to me. And he'll then be able to screen the calls and decide which ones to put through. And they'll come to me at a time that's much more convenient than uh, you know, interrupting me right in the middle of a, a really important meeting that I can't use the phone for. And if there are a number of interviews that come up on a particular issue, say there's a media fest going on, on on some new news story, then I know that he will also do the, the choreography, the arrangements, to decide uh, when and who does each interview. We find in Care Not Killing, if there's a really big euthanasia story, we might do up to 40 media interviews in a 48-hour period. And some of them will be on national radio, national television, regional radio and television, and then you get all the international channels coming in as well. And it's simply impossible for one person to do all of that, so you need a team of, of maybe three or four to cover it. And the thing a media consultant will do is structure and arrange them so that he knows if you're going off to Millbank Studios to do BBC News Channel live talking to camera, that, uh, that Sky News are also in that same building and so that you could do something there 20 minutes later and he'll arrange another person to be sitting in the office doing all the regional radio things down the phone line where he doesn't have to go to a studio. So it helps with connections, with protect protecting us and also about uh, arranging the opportunities. Secondly, identify sympathetic journalists to, to feed. And I've, I started off by saying that the media in Europe is very hostile to us. And I think in general, it is hostile on most of our issues. But on all of the, it'll be different from country to country. But that's certainly the case in the UK. But on every newspaper, every radio station, uh, there will be some producers who are sympathetic to our message and who have an ideological vested interest in helping it to get out. And so we need to identify who those people are. And you see it through the articles they write, through the, the, the way they conduct interviews, and then you know that these are the kind of people that we'll get a hearing for. So they're the ones to build up a relationship with. And the best way of uh, building relationships with sympathetic journalists is to feed them. They're all incredibly busy. It's very stressful working in a, a media studio, as I, I know a lot of you will do and, and will know. And you don't want to waste time. You want to speak to people who will prepare you properly. So the way you, if you like, groom journalists is that you, you uh, help them to see Whenever they ring you up, it's not going to be a wasted call. That first of all, you will be available. Secondly, you will give them a coherent message which will help them to put their news program together. And thirdly, you're available to provide them with quotes and with research material that will help them to, to build it as well. And so we've managed to cultivate over the last few years named journalists on the various newspapers so that we know if we have a story on this subject that this particular journalist will be amenable to a call and to know that there are certain times in the day when they'll be much more receptive than others. So often early in the morning they're having their meetings and they don't want to be interrupted. Late in the afternoon they're writing their stories to reach the deadlines but you'll find that late morning is a very good time to talk to them when they're doing their research and they've got and if you start to get the reputation as someone who is not over intrusive, who rings at appropriate times, who always delivers and helps them do their job, then they will come back to you. And so I have now, uh, some journalists will come through our media advisor, but there are journalists on all the major papers who if they have a story in our area of interest, they'll ring me up often first, right at the beginning, in order to uh, get our take on the story. And as I say, even if, if you don't end up doing the program, you can at least influence the way that it's presented and put them on to other people. Now, um, handling interviews on radio or television. I think, first of all, 
it's incredibly important to, de to decide what we're going to focus on in the media that we do, because none of us can be an expert on everything. And it can be really tempting to say yes to things where uh, you're not an expert and you simply don't know that you don't know and that you'll go on and, and say something inappropriate. So I have a, a limited area of issues where I do most of my media and most of what I do is on the beginning of life or the end of life and that's where I have experience and, and knowledge. Now that doesn't mean that I won't take on other things <coughs> and I have learnt that actually uh, when I first started out I thought it took, it took days to prepare for media interviews. I, I now know that on something where I have the baseline knowledge I can prepare pretty efficiently within an hour and I know where to go. So I'll, uh, I'll often say yes to doing an interview when I'm not anywhere near ready for doing it. I still don't know what my main points are going to be but I'll still say yes, I'll do this in two hours. And then I go and I find uh, a good article or a previous news story with the uh, main points in it and I begin to think about how I'm going to approach the interview. So it's, this is the importance of being willing to say yes when they ask you, even when you're in some doubt, and being prepared to drop everything. And the reason for this is because media never comes at a convenient time. <coughs> it always interrupts something, and almost always you will have to reschedule in order to, to do it. But when you realize the importance of it, the audience you're going to reach, you, you recognize that God may well have a plan for you that day that wasn't your plan initially when you woke up in the morning. So it's, it's knowing when you have to drop everything. I've talked already about knowing the kind of debate. Is it interview or debate, live or recorded? Who am I up against? Are they looking for sound bites or a longer piece or whatever? That's important. And then deciding what your key messages are before and media interviews are very different from writing an article or uh, you know, doing an essay where, uh, or, or perhaps even having a longer conversation with somebody where you're gradually going to build up to making your main points. In radio or television, you get your main points out right at the beginning and then you get your points of diminishing importance out if you've got the time to do it. But you never know in a media debate how many bites at the cherry you'll get, how many times they'll come back to you. And you, you may only get one opportunity. And then if you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to really put home my most powerful point next time and they never come back, then you've lost that opportunity. So whenever I'm doing an interview, I plan beforehand what the three or four points I'd like to make in order of importance so that I know what order to get them out and, and I, I know that I've got all of them. Next one here, get your messages out early regardless of what they ask you. Now the best politicians and the best media interviewees don't answer the question. But you don't know that they haven't answered the question. <laughs> because they're very skillful in put and turning the question around. And there are certain ways of doing that. So I know the first question I get may not be anything I want to answer at all. It might be something that if I answered it, it would damage my case. But you have to make it look as though you have answered or partially answered the question. And then you change tack. So uh, you might say, uh, you ask a question and say, oh no, of course not. Uh, uh, but, but the key issue in this whole debate is this. Or, uh, before we can, that's a good question, but before we can even start to look at that, there's, there's one key thing that we have to address. And so it's really important to take control. And the thing is that people listening to a radio debate, you'll never remember the question that the journalist asked 
the beginning that you're listening to it, but you will remember the answer that was given. And it may have no relation at all to the question that was asked. So what I'm saying is you decide what your key messages are and you get those messages out regardless of what you're asked, but you do it in a way that looks like you're not evading or avoiding or trying to fob them, fob them off. And of course it depends upon the standard of journalists you're, you're dealing with and you, you need to know uh, how good they are and, and how much uh, scope you've got. On the one hand, what, what I've, I've learnt, uh, what we've learnt at CMF over the years is that if you're doing an interview on Sky Television, down the camera, so you're sitting in a, in a, in a studio and you've got an earpiece in or that you can hear the interviewer coming through a microphone on your side and you're looking at the, you've got the television screen up here with you on it and you're looking at the camera and they're asking you the questions and you, you look straight at them and give the answers uh, down. Well, what I've learned with Sky Television is that the interviewers are generally pretty hopeless. They're not very experienced and, and they don't really know much about the subject at all. And so what I always do with Sky is I just, I just look into that camera and I just keep talking and talking and talking and I know that they'll almost never interrupt me, they'll just let me go for it. So you take advantage of that particular situation. On the other hand, if you're doing in Britain the Radio 4 BBC news program in the morning and you've got an incredibly skilled interviewer who is going to cross-examine you and interrupt you at every point, then you have to deal with that in a different kind of way. So it's knowing, knowing the, uh, the, the venue. Look for opportunities to turn the interview. And this doesn't happen uh, a lot, but there are occasions when you will have an opportunity to completely change the direction of an interview by bringing in something from left field that they weren't expecting that will then uh, bring it into your hands in terms of be being able to control the direction it's going. And this is where I think the Lord really helps and gives you inspiration. One of the most difficult interviews I ever had to do was on uh, BBC Radio Belfast in Northern Ireland and they were discussing the whole question of abortion for anencephaly, which is very, very severe brain damage in the children. Very difficult because it's a very emotional subject to talk about. And the interviewer I was up against, a chap called Stephen Nolan, was, I knew him well, he, doesn't let, he constantly interrupts, doesn't let you get a word in, dominates, very arrogant, and I knew it was going to be really tough. And uh, it so turned out that we were going to have two minutes for it and then he moved it after the news so that we had more time. And so you can imagine my first question from him was, so Dr. Saunders, you would force this poor woman to carry this brain-dead baby. You see, so I was initially completely on the back foot. And I just had this moment of inspiration. I said, Stephen, before you can even contemplate answering a question like that, you've got to ask yourself two crucially important questions. Now, of course, there's only one thing he can say now, isn't there? What are those questions? So, he said, so, so what are those questions, Dr. Saunders? So I said, the first question is this. What is, what actually is a baby with anencephaly? And the second question is this. How do you handle a woman who's just been told the most devastating news that she's ever received in her life? And for the first moment, time ever, he, he went absolutely quiet. So he said, so what is a baby with anencephaly? Now you see, now I was completely in control of the interview. And I, I said, well, it's a, it's a human being not brain dead, a baby with special needs, a dependent relative. And when you ask yourself how you treat this baby, you've got to ask the question, how do I treat a profoundly disabled, dependent relative? You see? 
So now it doesn't happen always. Generally, you're deciding your messages to get out and you're, you're getting them out as best you can. But there will be opportunities where you can take control and change the direction of an interview. Be pleasant but passionate and try, try to get the last word. Never get angry on uh, media, but you can get passionate and you should be uh, passionate and there's a difference between the two because if you get angry, you've lost it. On the other hand, if you can get your opponent angry, then uh, it's a different case altogether. And I was, uh, one chap I've debated several times is a, a guy called Philip Nitschke, who's a doctor who carries out euthanasia in Australia. He belongs to an organization called Ex International and travels the world's capitals um, doing surveys on helping people to kill themselves. And he's a really nasty character. And what uh, I, I work with a number of people in different countries on euthanasia prevention. And what we've learned with Philip Nitschke is that the key is to get him angry. And once he gets angry, he loses the debate. And then you're able to, to put your position. And what I've learned with, with Philip is that the way you get him angry is to quote what he said in uh, other things, because he's been very careless. So I, I was on an interview with him, a uh, debate with him once, and, uh, and, and I said, well, of course, uh, Dr. Nitschke, you're on public record in there, and I quoted the paper, as saying that you support euthanasia for bereaved elderly people and troubled teenagers, which was absolutely true. But you see, no one listening knew that. And he got, he got really. And I remained calm. He got so angry that he, he hung up and went off. Uh, and then he came back. Um, it, you know, they had to, to pursue him and ring him up. And he came back all apologetic and, uh, you know, and so on. So be, be pleasant. And try and get the last word. Because often what people remember is the very last word of an interview. And they'll forget what's, what's said earlier. It's not always in your hands. Um, being prepared. Uh, staying connected, the the the, the um, smartphone is an essential piece of equipment, I think, but you have to be up to the minute with what is happening in your area of specialty and know the stories that are out there and know where to find the best information. And one of the best ways of researching for us is just to use our own articles and blogs and sound bites that we've used many times uh, before. So I've mentioned uh, some of the things. It's, it's often Twitter that news stories will break first. So every day on the way into the office, I have certain things that I check. I check my Twitter feed. I check my uh, BBC uh, health stories. I'll look on Google News at, with a few keywords, and that will tell me if there's anything brewing that I need to be ready for uh, that particular day or to, to write on. Preparation. Uh, horizon scanning, which is just to be aware of what's coming up. There'll be certain key dates where reports come out or bills are being debated or uh, a new story is going to break where you can be prepared ahead of time. And to know uh, your position on the issue and have it uh, already uh, agreed beforehand. With, uh, with Care Not Killing, we have about a dozen short paragraphs which describe our position on, on every issue around the debate, so that whenever we're asked to write an article for a new news feed or prepare for a media interview, we know exactly where to go. And you can use the same sort of thing, just repackaged or reworked uh, in two different media publications. And of course, they never read each other. And if it's, it's a time part, you can reuse the same material again uh, and again. And then over the page, I've talked about the um, support structures, a campaign director who is directing the activity and the responses, press officer, I talked about our media consultant, office administrators, people in the office who've got time to be able to get reports up, get stories online, 
to be able to interact with social media and so on. Uh, media spokespeople, if there's a big story where you need more than one person or people aren't available. So we have a list of names and phone numbers and if we know a big story is going to come up and break on a particular day, we'll prepare people a few days ahead of time and brief them so that they're available and know exactly what hours of the day that they are around. Uh, advisors, wise people to consult who aren't involved in the direct firing line at all but have got the time to think and reflect and listen and give wise advice. And then uh, the whole army of other people who can, who again might not do the media but can contribute in online debate uh, and so on. Uh, the resources that are listed there, I think I've largely covered those things already. And then just uh, in closing, some of the personal challenges. I've talked a lot about anxiety already. Uh, it does happen. It's part of what it's all about. The, the, good, the good thing to remember about it is that being a little bit anxious actually helps you perform much better. If you go into a media interview and you're too relaxed, then often you won't take the initiative in the way that you need to. So to be a little bit charged up before you go in, particularly on television where you've got to lot, be a lot more animated, is, is really important. So, so welcome anxiety as a friend and realize that as time goes on, you get more experienced, it becomes much better and you feel less anxious. Reticence, the importance of not shrinking back but taking the opportunities. Clarity, working out what your messages are beforehand. In end of life things, which is probably the thing I do most of, uh, much of what I say I've said a, a hundred times before, and it may sound spontaneous, but it's virtually now memorized. I know the ex exact way I'm going to frame the answer. I know what all the questions are going to be and, and know exactly how to do it. So it often doesn't take much preparation. Pride, uh, I, I mentioned, is, is an issue. But I think it's important to cultivate the, the attitude of how you can always be improving and, and to remind yourself that, that uh, if you can do these things at all, it's because God gives you the ability to do it. It's a gift which he supplies, so it's not something we have ourselves. And I never come out of a media interview feeling that I've done it perfectly. I always come out thinking, oh, I wish I'd said that, or I should have gone this, or I could have just been a bit clearer with this. So if, you're, if you've got the attitude that you're always seeking to improve, then I think that helps uh, with that whole issue. And then there's the, the thing about publicity addiction. And this is something to be aware of, particularly in the middle of, of media fest, is that the, there is a certain addictive quality to doing media, that you, you get a kind of vibe or energy from it. Uh, and that, that can both help you, but you also need... Uh, to realize that, that you're not being motivated by it and that you're taking things on to feed some kind of um, addictive uh, desire that you, you have. And so I think it's always important to ask, you know, why am I doing this? But also to ask, is there somebody else who could do it, who I could involve? Should I step down this time and just get on with something that's a more important priority?